We're introducing Dr. Habiba Atta, who is a senior lecturer of environmental microbiology in the Department of Microbiology at the Belo University area in Nigeria. Her areas of research include bioremediation, bioaerosols, and indoor air quality, microbial ecology, renewable energy, and biocontrol. She's a recipient of the Innovators of Tomorrow Award from the Step B project of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Nigeria in conjunction with World Bank. She's also a Petroleum Technology Development Fund as PTDF scholar and a Fulbright Scholar of 2021. Dr. Atai is an Associate Editor and Book Reviewer at Fulbright Chronicles. She is a member of several professional bodies and also a member of the following nonprofit organizations. Organization of Women in Science for the, development, the, for the de Developing World, Climate Action Group, and an expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Research Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, should be taking us on the topic, planning a successful Fulbright visiting scholar application. So join me as we welcome Dr. Habibata. Please, you have the floor now, Ma. Welcome. Mm. Hello, Ma, are you there? Hello? Hello, Ma. Ah. 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 Well, we can't hear your audio. We can't hear your audio, ma. We can see you, but your voice is not here. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, sorry, my network is a bit shaky because the, the, the weather is bad, it's about to rain. So I apologize, I went off for a few seconds there. If it's really bad, maybe I'll put off my, my, my video and just uh, so that the network will be a bit stable. Okay, so um, can I go on? Yes, please, yes, please, you can. Yes, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, can you, you can go on. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. 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 So um thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Habiba Atta. I was a Fulbright visiting scholar in um at Rutgers University in the United States of America in 2021. I was actually supposed to go in 2020, but because of the COVID, I now went in 2021. So without much ado, I will share my screen. So let me know if you can see my screen, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can, Doctor. Yes, we can okay. see your, your, your screen now. Okay, okay. Um, so the title of my presentation is Planning a Successful Application for the Fulbright Research Program. Now, let's start with the name. Where does Fulbright come from? So Fulbright was named after Senator William Fulbright. He was the longest serving uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And then he joined Congress in 1943. He taught for some time in the university in the US um, in law, 
was a law professor. And then uh, he was fully involved in ensuring there was a lot of um, diplomatic relations between the United States and other countries. So this came off the heel of um, after the World War II, and then he felt that it was very important for relationships to be built between the US and other countries. And through his hard work, and what we now know as the United Nations was formed. So the Fulbright program has been in existence for more than 70 years. Um, over 370,000 people all over the world have benefited from it, from about um, 160 countries. So it's, it's a very big um, exchange program. The Fulbright um, program is the largest exchange program in the world. So apart from just um, researchers and lecturers, there are also exchange programs for students, um, for teachers in primary and secondary schools between different um, countries, but the common denominator is the United States. So it's either between the United States and other country or someone visiting the United States from other countries or American um, Fulbright scholars visiting other countries of the world. So it has been existing for more than 70 years now. So I'll just dive right into the Fulbright program itself. The official sponsor of the Fulbright program is the United States Department of State. Now, under this, we have um, two or three parastatals that are actively involved in funding and ensuring that everything runs smoothly. You have the Institute of International Education, IIE, which is the official parastatal which administers this um, visiting program for the scholars and researchers. So, the main objective of the Fulbright program is to promote mutual understanding between the United States and then people of other countries. So the main hallmark of the Fulbright um, scholarship is education. So it's all centered around education. So for the purpose of this presentation, I would focus on the Fulbright African Research Scholar Program, also known as the first Fulbright Visiting Scholar. But other than this, like I mentioned before, there are other categories of Fulbright Awards. Another one that is very common and popular in Nigeria is the Fulbright Foreign Student Program in which PhD students undertake research within a year in the United States. So they're hosted by a supervisor in the United States and then they complete their research there. They don't spend the whole uh, research um, program in the United States, just about nine months to a year in the United States. So, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be focusing on the Fulbright Visiting Scholar of which I was also a beneficiary. So the Fulbright Visiting Scholar has two categories. The first one is for postdoctoral research, and then the second one is for curriculum development. Now, the usual um, is three to nine months, but for um, lecturers going for the curriculum development option, they don't have the liberty to stay up to nine months, unlike those that are going for the postdoctoral research. So, what are the things that determine how well your application turn out? There are four things, basically. The first one is your academic qualifications. Are you qualified um, to go for this program? Do you have a PhD? And even if you have a PhD, your other degrees, what, are, what is the class of your degree and all that? Second is the project feasibility. How feasible is your proposed projects, your proposed research? How feasible is it? Um, is it significantly going to add um, to knowledge and what have you? Third is the personal leadership ability. Fulbright is known for grooming um, scholars to become leaders in the society, in their country and in the nation at large. So through your application, they want to see if you have those leadership qualities. And then finally, available grant funds. Now grant funds usually come from Fulbright itself, that's the United States um, Department of State. But um, usually the host institution contributes to part of the funding of the um, scholar, either in form of um, research materials, apart from last phase, reagents, and what have you. So before you start your Fulbright application, there are certain things you must bear in mind. First of all, it's a yearly call, usually in the first quarter of the year. So you want to make sure that before you even start the application, you have all your requirements. The first thing is you have to identify your area of research. It's not enough to have a broad, loose area of research. You must have a particular research in which you are interested in, because this will define how well you get a, a willing host, because before you even start the application, you have to send your proposal to a willing host. So you have to even know your area of research. Is it relevant to Nigeria? 
is it solving any problem for anybody? Is it part of the SDGs? So you have to, first of all, identify your area of research. The next thing is establishing contact with your host in the United, um, in the United States. So if you don't have a willing host, it doesn't mean your application will not go through, but it increases your chances, that's one. And two, you have already built a relationship with your host professor. So it's usually advisable to try and establish contact with your host. And then when the person gives you a letter of invitation, you can now use it in your application. Third, you have to prepare your documents. You need your credentials, your project statement. So your project statement is your proposal of the research which you want to conduct in the United States. And then finally, you have to watch out for the call for applications if it hasn't come out yet. And then you can now begin the process of applying. So when we get to the application process proper, you have to, first of all, create a profile on your country page. So that country page, I put it in red because for somebody in Pakistan, an older person in Nigeria or Sweden, you have different websites in which you use to apply. That is because every country has their unique requirements. And then there's also cases where you have joint funding from both the United States and also another country. So all these things vary. So that is why any Fulbright application depends on the country. So if you're a Nigerian, you have to go to the country page for Nigeria to make your application. The website is always made available. The next thing is to ensure you read instructions on the application. I know there's a popular saying that Nigerians do not like reading uh, instructions and fine print. So we're all guilty of that. But please, you have to read the instructions. It will guide you and it will help you in filling certain areas. There are certain specifications which will be mentioned in the instructions. So please make time, slowly read the instructions before you start filling your application. And then make sure you stick to the number of words or characters. Certain sections where they're required to write a little bit, they'll tell you the number of characters that is allowed and the number of words. So you want to make sure that you write only what is relevant and what is required and what is related to your proposal. Try as much as possible not to go out of scope and talk about things that are not important or will not even help your application. So, in the application, there are several sections. So I'll only pick on those ones that I feel are most important. And after the presentation, if you have questions, you're always welcome to ask, but I'm sure many people have already started the applications already. So when you come to the section of most significant professional ac accomplishments, honor, awards, publications, so as much as possible, please focus on those that are relevant, those that are relevant, especially as a researcher. So. If you have an award for maybe best um, poster prize, that is something to talk about. If you won a grant, um, a, a well-renowned grant for some research, that is something to talk about. If you're a co-researcher in a grant, that is something to talk about. If you have, if you have gotten scholarship um, opportunities before, you have succeeded in scholarship, that is very important. If you have won best researcher in your institution in Soye, that is also very important. So these are the kind of things you should mention. You shouldn't talk about things that do not showcase you, that does, does not showcase your potential as a researcher. Now in the project details. So the project details here, I'm referring to the actual proposal itself. So in the proposal, the first thing is your title. The title should be very easy to understand. It should be direct. As much as possible, do not use words that are not relevant or do not hit the nail on the head when it comes to the title. So make sure your title is direct, simple, and very easy to understand by anybody. Your summary of a project statement is a place where you have a summary. So it's just like a synopsis. It's not like an abstract because an abstract also has findings and conclusion and recommendations. So for this purpose, you haven't done the research yet. So it's not like an abstract. It just describes what exactly you want to do. What is your aim? What is the aim of your proposal? And what is the scope of your proposed project? And then briefly just outline your methodology. Do not give details in this um, summary. So in the summary, you just outline, just give highlights of the methods in which you want to use to achieve your objective. And as much as possible, avoid technical jargon. Do not use too many words that people would not understand. So in the project statement, the first section is the background. So in the background, 
as much as possible, you have to review recent literature on your proposed topic. So when I say recent, you try and um, work within as most, as at most, sorry, 10 years. So try and work within 10 years, five years, last five years, review literature, relevant literature that hit the nail on the head of your proposal. Try as much as possible not to talk about things that are not directly referring to your proposal. And then also in your background, even though you wouldn't state statement of problem, but you also fuse your statement of problem and then um, justification in your background. What are those gaps you hope to fill with your research? Why do you even need to conduct this research? Is this something that is leading off of some research you have conducted before? Is this something that is um, a topical issue? Is it something that has been neglected for a long time, has been studied in many parts of the world, but has been neglected in your country? So you have to really sell yourself in the background. So you mention all those gaps that you hope to fill with your proposal. In your objectives, as much as possible, you have to make sure you are specific. Your objectives should be specific and they should be sequential. So they should be progressive. The first one should lead to the second, the second to the third, and so on. So make sure your objectives do not have too many words. They should also be very simple and direct. And they should be measurable. So if your objectives are measurable, it could either be quantitative or qualitative because we're all experts in different fields now. So depending on your kind of research, just make sure as much as possible, your objectives are measurable and very specific. Now going to the methodology, I know sometimes when we're asked to talk about our research, we tend to go off and just get carried away and talk and talk and talk too much and even lose the person listening to us. So, but for this proposal, you want to try not to use too many technical jargon and you have to ensure that your methodology also consistently follows what your objective states. If your sub first objective is sample collection, the first thing you should talk about in your methodology is sample collection. And in your methodology, do not use too many words. Just go straight to the points. Just briefly describe what you want to do. And the key thing is not to use words that are too technical because there are people that will read your proposal that are not necessarily in your field. There are so many thousands of applications that they receive every year. So there are people that will read the proposal and they are not even in your field. It's, it, it's a whole team. And even if you get shortlisted for the interview, you find there are people in the panel that are not necessarily in your field, but they also want to be carried along. They want to have an idea of what you're talking about. So try not to be too technical. Use simple terms. If you um, if you if you are used to what you call in science communication, SciComm, try to use words that people outside your field, non-experts, would also understand. So you should try to be detailed, but at the same time, be concise, brief, but detailed in your methodology just enough for someone to get the juice of the matter, what exactly you want to do. And then if you have um, sources, which you have gotten most of the time, you, you always have sources where you get your methodology from, whether it's standard methods or what have you, acknowledge all those sources. And then make sure you don't excessively explain your methods. That's why I said sometimes we tend to get lost and we get carried away with our research. So, but for this purpose, because there are so many people that are going to read it, and then they are going to go through so many applications, they do not have time to read so many things. So all you have to do is go straight to the points, be very detailed, but at the same time, use simple terms that even a layman would understand. And then another important section is the significance. So what is the relevance of your study to your country and even maybe all over the world? You have to explain. Is this something that people have been doing over and over again? If it is, then you, you have nothing to sell. That means it, because it's a very competitive fellowship. So you want to make sure your proposal is going to stand out. It might be something you wanted to achieve maybe during your doctoral research and you didn't achieve it. Or it could be something you are working on with your postgraduate students and perhaps you don't have enough funding or facilities. So it has to be significant and it has to contribute to knowledge generally. 
And then you have to justify why do you have to conduct that research in the United States? So you think about those kind of reasons. For instance, you have, you could say you have better facilities and resources depending on the kind of research that you're working on. And another thing is you have more opportunities to network and to join uh, professional societies when you are in the US. So you have to give them enough justification, even while you are writing your project statement, why you have to conduct that study in the United States and why you should be awarded a Fulbright Fellowship. So under the other section, any other thing that you feel is very important in your research, but is not captured in the actual application. For instance, during my own um, stay in the US, I had to go with, move with soil samples, but there was no way I could, I could actually bring that out. And because you are going to a foreign country, they have their own laws and regulations and all that. You have to actually state all those things. So I had to, under the other, I had to state that I will be traveling with so, so, so quantity of soil samples. So if you want to go with um, um, maybe draft of your work, depending on the kind of samples. So anything that is not captured and you feel is relevant to your research, you can't do without it. Under the other section, please, you have to state it because if you leave your other section blank and at the point of traveling, those things, if you get shortlisted and those things come up, you, you may you may run into a difficult um, situation trying to explain that way. So it's better they know beforehand that, okay, this person has this, um, has this issue, which is relating to their research. So if you have anything, maybe you want to conduct field work or you want to visit um, a place, a site while you are there, you have to mention it in the section called order. So just general tips, general tips, avoid grammatical errors as much as possible use Grammarly, use spell check, ask someone to read your work and also read your work over and over again. Um, grammatical errors are very off-putting. It could just discourage someone from reading um, your proposal and going through your work. And then ensure that any information you provide are consistent with your credentials. So if you say you are, let's say you are 50 years old and you've uploaded your passport, your, your travel document, and then it's showing that you are older or younger, that is going to uh, count as a negative for you. So ensure that whatever you are saying is consistent with your credentials. And then um, when you are uploading your CV, so it's very important to you draft your CV in a way that is to fit into the recommended guideline. So even if you have bulky CVs, we tend to have bulky CVs in universities and research institutes. Try as much as possible to focus on just those things that are important. You don't have to list all your publications. You can just list a few that are relevant to that research we are going to conduct. So you list just a few um, publications, a few conference papers, just those things that are important. And then you include links to your um, social media handles, your ORCID page, um, research gates, links in Google Scholar. So if they want more information, they could always click on that. And then the style of your language in your project statement should be very comprehensible, even to people like I mentioned earlier, even people that are not in your academic discipline. So even a layman should be able to pick up your work and then have an idea, have a general idea of what you want to do. So you have to bear that in mind. Also, your proposed research should be in, a, in an area which shows that you can actually conduct that research. If your CV and um, your publications, when they check, check your papers online, is showing that you are more into ecology and you are stating that you are going to work on, let's say, um, mining, it's not, it's not adding up. So they're not going to take you seriously. So you have to ensure that everything, everything you use in the application is actually adding up and is making sense. So if, if it's something that you have worked on your PG, as much as possible, I want to encourage you guys to work on something that you have already worked on before. Maybe you have supervised postgraduate students in that area, or it's a continuation of your doctoral research, or just something that you have been working on for some time, you already have experience in it. And then, so it shows that you already have expertise and you know what you are doing. So those are the general tips I would like to mention. And uh, with that, I will thank you you for listening and um, if you have any questions the floor is open thank you very much thank you so much for a very detailed and concise presentation like i followed and it's really something that um like it just went it hit the points well and i feel that anyone that did for those that were even asking about
decide what it's about and they can tell anyone tomorrow. Hello. So I don't know if anyone has a question they could share at this time. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, I am Jamila Baba Ali. Please, Dr. Habiba, I want to ask a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, just ask your question. She's listening. Okay, okay. Um, I've already started applying for this Fulbright um, scholarship. So I have a sample already that has, um, I've already worked work on, part of it I've worked on. So part of the recommendation from that research I've done is what I want to comprehend and will improve now in this application. So I don't know, do I need to state the properties of that particular material that I want to use? Or I will just give them the proposal without stating the properties of a material, just mentioning I want to use so so material. Um, Thank you. It's, it's better if you mention what you have already done before. Can you hear me, Dr. Jamila? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Ma. okay. So it's it's better if you exp if you mention it, like um, in your project statement, you can say maybe there's a problem you are trying to like you are trying to continue from where you stopped. So you 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 just put a reference. You know, you put like you cite something in bracket. Maybe you from your previous work, from my earlier work, blah, blah, blah. And that is why now I'm now focusing on this, 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 this. I don't know if I'm making sense. So it's, it's better if you apply, if you mention it. So it doesn't seem like it's it's just an isolation. It's just something different. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, Ma, you've done that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Can I, can I ask a question? Okay, yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Kariyo, for this wonderful presentation. My name is Idris Abdurrahman. Uh, my question is uh, around the area of research and also on the host on the host universities. First of all, is there any available list of the host universities that, if one is interested in applying for Fulbright scholarship, can apply from? And that is one. Then number two, regarding the area of research. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it is better if someone can have a particular problem that he wants to solve, and also the problem must align with the or should align with the SDG goals. So that is, I just need more explanation on this, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, for the first question, um, because the United States is a, is a very huge country. In fact, it's like Texas on its own. It's supposed to be a country as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So it's like so many countries in the U.S. So and that also translates to the number of institutions they have. So while there isn't any particular list of institutions, because almost all the institutions are eligible for the Fulbright um, Fellowship. So I think you shouldn't focus more on the institutions. Your focus should be on your PI because this is postdoctoral research. So you should try and get someone that is actually in line with your research, wherever that person may be in the US. So that should be your focus. So there isn't any lists per se, because most of them, you can conduct the research in most of them, even what they call community colleges. In fact, they even encourage people to even go to community colleges. It's just that most of the time, you don't find those kind of professors in those um, universities. You find them in all the other the universities, the big universities. So the community colleges are sort of like polytechnics. So focus more on the person you want to work with. Just ensure that he's in your area. And then practically any of the universities would serve for your research. And um, so your second question now, I don't think I understand it. You said, what if, can you just tell me your second question again? Okay, the second question is about the area of research that you mentioned that it should be trying to solve a particular problem. And also it should be aligned with the SDGs. So I just want more explanation on this. Oh, okay. I didn't say it had to be in line with the SDGs. I'll just give an example. I'm just giving an example okay. because SDG, whatever your field is, is something that everybody resonates with. Everybody understands the SDG, SDGs. So I'll just give an example, but it doesn't have to be 
um, answering one of the SDG goals or, or whatever. So just oh, make yeah, sure you're solving okay. a problem. Everybody's field is relevant. Just ensure you're solving a problem. Okay, thank you. So on the issue of the curriculum development option, mm -hmm. uh, what, how, what, how do they define a, a senior scholar? Is it a senior lecturer or below senior lecturer? Okay, because the, um, what, what we, our nomenclature of um, ranks is a little bit different from theirs. So they don't really define the rank. It's just the number of years in which you have attained your PhD degree. So mm -hmm. um, if you are what they define as recent, within three, four years of your PhD, so anything above that, you are seen as a, as a senior um, academic, senior research scholar. So for the curriculum development is the same and um, the entry requirement is the same as for the postdoctoral research. So once they have seen that, okay, you have finished your PhD within certain number of years, you know, um, at least three, four years. Okay, so you qualify as a senior um, academic. So that's just it. So there's no rank. Yeah. There's no rank stated per se. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. The last three, sorry. You're welcome. Uh, you said that the application... So there's the first... one teacher, Abdul, uh, Fadula, that has been wanting to ask the question. Isa Fadula, can you please ask your question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Um, my part of my question was taken by the last uh, person, but I need emphasis talking about establishing contact with host in institution. And uh, you try to allay our fear that, okay, you can forget about the institution, but just get the PI. Even that need emphasis. Uh, what are the ways? What are the ways to make that easy to get a, 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 a PI? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Issa, for the question. Um, the first thing is, is a lot of hard work. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a lot of hard work because you have to send cold emails, except if you already have established collaboration with someone in the US, which how many of us have, right? So it's a lot of work because you have to keep sending cold emails to professors. Sometimes they don't respond to your emails and sometimes they'll respond, but they'll tell you they don't have funding for that or they have funding, but for something else, you know? Like um, the first time I applied, I applied like in 2018, um, the professor I was going to um, use as my host never responded to my email. I never knew that he was deceased until I tried checking online. I kept checking and now saw that he was actually deceased. So that's why he didn't respond to my email. And even though I was shortlisted for the interview, I never got picked because they couldn't also establish contact with him. And even though I told them this person, I found that he's deceased, but somehow I think it affected my application, I can't say. So I had to start looking for another host. But luckily for me, what I've always done, because if you are in, um, if you are in um, the field of research, what some of us do, you know that, okay, there is a likelihood of potential collaboration. So I already had like um, in my, my jota, I had a list of potential collaborators in the US based on papers I had read during my master's and my PhD. So I have cited their papers and I'm like, okay, this is someone that I'll I would like to work with in the future. So I had already kept written those names down years ago. I never knew I would even use them for Fulbright. So what I was doing was I was going through that list and sending um, cold emails to all these professors. So based on their, their response. So that's how I got the second person that I used for this next applica application and was now successful. So it's a lot of work and a lot of patience and a lot of a lot of patience, I tell you, because sometimes they wouldn't even respond to you. So you just have to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep sending emails. But if you have, if you know someone there in your field, the person can actually, if the person can't host you himself or herself, the person can suggest somebody else. So because of what I went through, so what I did was since when I came back, I one or two people that are in my field. So I was able to recommend, not my own host particularly, because they're in my field, but not in the same area of research. I was able to, and um, because of my networking while I was there, I was able to link one or two people with a potential uh, host. So it's a lot of work and you have to be ready to put yourself out there, you know, so, but it works. Thank you, Ma. We have Idris. Idris, can you have, can you ask your question? Okay, thank you. That, my question is on the period of the application. You mentioned first quarter. Uh, I think from January to April, right? 
-hmm. This is just the question. Is it open well, now? Period, or... Okay. Okay, the period of application. So what I meant was that the call comes in the first quarter of the year. So anything from February, the call is out. They advertise first quarter of the year. And then the application closes mostly in June either last week of May or early June, most of the time, that's standard. So from early in the year, from January, February, you have to start looking out for the application. But the, ap the application actually closes either last week of May or June. Like this year is closing in June. Okay, thank you very much. That means it's open now, right? I will try. Yes, to yes, it's open. Yeah, I'll check. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, uh, I also have a question. Sorry, I think no one's hands are up, so I can ask my question now. My question is actually, you didn't talk about that for PhD students, customers of that our own area of interest currently. So how does that work? Sorry, so I didn't talk about what? The, the program for PhD students. You know, you mentioned they have that oh. for PhD and then you now asked for that. You now talked about that of right. the scholars and you went into that. Right. So I was like, can you write right. that a bit? Okay. So because I have never been a beneficiary of that, I only have a little knowledge about that one. What I do know is that um, it's a little bit different for the one for the researchers, the senior scholars, because one, the person is seen as um, a student, so he, he or she has to write English, um, English test, proficiency test, either TOEFL or IELTS. They have to write that exam. And uh, even if you are coming from in, an English speaking country like Nigeria, that's one. And then the second thing is, I'm not really sure if it works directly with the, with the P, PI himself, like for the scholars, I think they may have to go through the school system to get um, a willing supervisor. But other than that, most of the things are actually the same. They're actually the same. And then for my interaction with people that benefited from the PhD program, it seems to me like um, the one for the senior scholars, I think it's a bit, should I say maybe a bit more relaxed? <laughs> maybe because you're already, they already see you as a colleague. So I think uh, it's a little bit more relaxed than that one. And then they, they are also, um, they also have provision for accommodation. They get accommodation for them. Whereas for the senior scholars, you are responsible for getting your own accommodation. They only give you the money to pay your rents, but you are responsible for getting your own accommodation. So I think the major difference between the two is just the fact that they have to write English proficiency tests. And then the, the system of application might be a little bit different because they might have to go through the school itself instead of just directly with the, with the PI. But I can't really say because I don't really know much about that one. Thank you very much, Ma. You're welcome. Please, do we have any other question? Emma, um, uh, if the opportunity is still there, uh, can you talk about some other requirements, maybe from, from, from our institution, for example, in Nigeria here, that is needed as, as document to back up the application? Are there, do, do you have to see the vice chancellor? Do you have to? Yeah, that, sure that's, you know that's a very good question. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so Dr. Issa, the first requirement is um, once you have gotten, and let me just tell you, when you've gotten, when you have gotten the fellowship, let me say when now, being positive, when you have gotten it, the first thing you get is an email. You will not get a letter of award immediately, but you still have to apply to the school. And then, for example, uh, ABU, they'll ask you to bring the letter of award with your application. Okay, because you are going to apply, I'm going to be waiting for so, so amount of time, isn't it? So what you do is, before that letter of award comes, you, you print your email, and attach it pending when the letter of award comes. So when you submit that, they'll give you um, an agreement, fellowship agreement and a bond to fill, to sign that um, after a social period of time, you are coming back to the university, you are not going to run away, you are not going to jackpot. <laughs> so um, that's just it. So you are going to sign a bond with your institution, but writing to the school that you're leaving doesn't, it doesn't really take much because the response is very fast. Within days, you get a response and they ask you to fill the, the bond and all that. The only delay might come from the Fulbright end when you ask them to send your actual letter of award because 
it's um, a lot of parastatals, a lot of people are involved in it. So sometimes, and also the U.S. Embassy, they are the ones that handle our application in Nigeria. So when it comes to um, like your application, correspondence, getting your visa, getting your ticket, it will all be handled by the embassy. So it's just left to you to ensure that if you're living in January, so by um, October, you start disturbing whoever is in correspondence with you. Please, I need my letter of award. I need my letter of award. I need my letter of award because I need to apply. But before they do that, you can always print your email and use it just um, before the letter of award comes. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, but in, in, submit, in submitting the application now, mm. I don't have to request anything from ABU, for example. This um, plenary, except plenary submission. And you have gone through it. That's what I'm asking. Do I need, is it just between me and them without the school getting yes. out? Yes, that's what okay. I'm trying to tell you. That's what I was trying oh, to okay. say. All okay. you need, okay. all you need is a letter from maybe your HOD. I know there's okay. a tour. You need anything at all. You need anything like that from the institution. Your HOD will suffice. You don't need to get from the VC or the dean. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, too, sir. Any other question? In the absence of any, we really want to thank you, Ma, for taking our time and for answering our questions and clarifying our, our, our doubts as well. So, um, Thank you very much. And we hope that in Thank the you nearest too. future, you also, you also present another topic because this was quite interesting and straight to the point. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you everyone for Thank attending. You See Thank you, you for having next. Me. It was a pleasure. Day. Thank you so much. So do have a pleasant day. Too. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody.